Now, Kate Forbes doesn't do interviews on Sundays for religious reasons. Usually it would be no big deal to pre-record an interview with a politician. But when it comes to the SNP, it turns out that two days really is an awfully long time in politics because since her interview, the head of communications quit after unwittingly giving out false information about SNP membership numbers. And now the party's chief executive, Peter Murrell, has also resigned after taking responsibility for the fiasco. Now, Mr Murrell, by the way, also happens to be Nicola Sturgeon's husband. So that's all worth bearing in mind when you listen to this interview with Kate Forbes. We started by talking about independence. I think that's the democratic uh, approach. I think too much in our political debate right now is vitriolic, it's abusive, it's disrespectful. And actually, when it comes to the SNP, if we want to win independence, it comes down to respecting our fellow citizens and the reasons why they haven't yet been persuaded. I think many in the SNP are surprised that there hasn't been a more substantial shift of support for independence, not least when we've seen a Conservative government attack devolution, we're in the throw of a Tory cost of living crisis and so on. And I think for me as leader, it's about reaching out beyond the divides, reaching out to people who uh, haven't yet been persuaded and making the case for how Scotland can be wealthier and fairer. You know, in the, in the context of a leadership contest, it's easy to forget that there's a lot more than, that unites us than divides us, not least wanting to eradicate poverty, wanting to see a growing prosperous economy, wanting to ensure that people aren't fuel poor. I think the path to that is good governance and ultimately putting the powers around Scotland's future into the hands of those in Scotland. And talking about good governance, um, you wrote a joint letter with Ash Regan uh, calling for information about the current membership status of the SNP. What exactly are your concerns about this process? Well, I have no concerns about the process, so I have full confidence in, in the integrity of the election contest. All three candidates, in fact, were asking for SNP membership figures because it stands to reason that in any election, the candidates should know the size of the electorate, the size of the, uh, the group of people that they are trying to persuade. Um, and I'm very relieved that those figures have now been confirmed. But I think those figures demonstrate that continuity won't cut it. My whole pitch has been around building on the SNP's track record, but re-earning the trust of of our SNP voters as well as the wider public and the fact that we've lost so many members in such a short period of time I think demonstrates that we do need to shift focus and deliver change. Continuity won't cut it. Who is the continuity candidate? Well I think if you were to ask uh, the other candidates um, at least one has a uh, quite happily and readily accepted that he is the, the continuity candidate and I have great respect for his approach but ultimately there is a profound choice facing SNP members because I offer a, a new approach. I want to put our economy front and centre. I want to reach out to no voters, as I've already said. And I want to ensure that we eradicate poverty and rebuild the strength of the trust that we enjoy with the Scottish people. That's how the SNP has won multiple elections over the last 16 years. And if we want to continue to win elections, then I believe that we are at a crossroads and we need to take the approach that will ultimately ensure we maintain that trust going forward. So you say that you've got confidence in the process. Ash Regan told me last week, who's obviously another of the candidates, that she thinks that there's a conflict of interest with Nicola Sturgeon's husband remaining as SNP chief executive while the contest is ongoing. Do you agree with that? No, I don't, because I think that uh, we have, obviously, the, the third party electronic provider of voting um, and also because I have full confidence in the process. Ultimately, this will be determined by SNP members. And I think there would be outrage from the SNP members if there was any perception of a, a lack of integrity. So I think steps have been taken in order to uh, ensure the integrity of the process. Uh, and I'm certainly confident that whoever is elected will be the person who SNP members have chosen. Now, after her resignation, uh, Nicola Sturgeon said, Scotland is a progressive country and the views of the next First Minister therefore matter. Do you consider yourself to have progressive views? I do, indeed. I think we live in a pluralistic, tolerant society 
which allows space for everyone. And of course, the definition of progressivity is that we stand up for those who have no voice and ensure that we are representing their interest. In Scotland today, there are extraordinarily deep social economic inequalities with one in four children in poverty, with the life expectancy between those in the most deprived and the least deprived areas far too wide. And I focused during my campaign in not just meeting with those who perhaps have a vote, but meeting, for example, with women from ethnic minority groups who have gone through the asylum seeker process and who truly have no uh, voice and, and Ukrainian refugees. So I think Scotland has made great strides. We need to be a welcoming, tolerant country. And my hope is that there's place for everyone. The Scottish Government have committed, committed by the end of the year to have ended gay and trans conversion therapy. Now, in the debate on Monday night on Sky News, our political editor Beth Rigby asked you six times if you would ban conversion therapy, even if the individual consented. Um, you didn't exactly give a straight answer to that. Now you've had a bit of time to think. What is the position on that? Yeah, so I said in that debate, and I'll say again today, that conversion therapy is abhorrent. Uh, we've been through a process where many people have shared their lived experiences. And on a hugely sensitive issue like this, I think it's important that it's those lived experiences that inform the approach that we take to the debate. Now, I understand that there are people who will say that there's no non-coercive approach to conversion therapy. And I certainly, you know, I'm, I'm not here to, 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 to argue with that. I'm here to build on the experiences that people have shared and ensure that any approach we take to the legislation, it reflects uh, those lived experiences. But it is a very, very sensitive issue. And I do think it's important that rather than give you sort of quick, sort of gotcha answers um, on a matter of such importance, that we do reflect on the consultation responses and we ensure the legislation uh, bans such an abhorrent practice. Um, now, just finally, there are three people in the race, but really it's kind of two horses at the front, yourself and Hamza Yousaf. Do you think he'd make a good First Minister? I think he would, yes. I do think, I think he has great talents. I think he's got an ability to connect with anybody, to, to, to reach people. He has obviously been one of my colleagues for many years and I've seen him in action. And I think that right now the people of the SNP have a genuine choice to make. And what I offer is change, building on our track record, bringing a level of competence and a track record to my approach and ensuring that we do deliver economic prosperity as a means of eradicating poverty. Would you serve in his cabinet if you're asked? Well, it's, it's somewhat presumptuous to assume I will be asked, um, but certainly um, I'd be happy uh, to serve with him or to serve under him.